Chapter 37. Percy. Aeroplanes or cannibals? No contest. Percy would have preferred driving Grandma Zhang's Cadillac all the way to Alaska with fireball throwing ogres on his tail rather than sitting in a luxury golf stream. He'd flown before. The details were hazy, but he remembered a, a Pegasus named Blackjack. He'd even been in a plane once or twice, but a son of Neptune, Poseidon, whatever, didn't belong in the air. Every time the plane hit a spot of turbulence, Percy's heart raced, and he was sure Jupiter was slapping them around. He tried to focus as Frank and Hazel talked. Hazel was reassuring Frank that he'd done everything he could for his grandmother. Frank had saved them from the Lestrogonians and got them out of Vancouver. He'd been incredibly brave. Frank kept his head down, like he was ashamed to have been crying, but Percy didn't blame him. The poor guy had just lost his grandmother and seen his house go up in flames. As far as Percy was concerned, shedding a few tears about something like that didn't make you any less of a man, especially when you had just fended off an army of ogres that wanted to eat you for breakfast. Percy still couldn't get over the fact that Frank was a distant relative. Frank would be his, uh, what? A great times? A thousand nephew? Too weird for words. Frank refused to explain exactly what his family gift was, but as they flew north, Frank did tell them about his conversation with Mars the night before. He explained the prophecy Juno had issued when he was a baby, about his life being tied to a piece of firewood, and how he had asked Hazel to keep it for him. Some of that Percy had already figured out. Hazel and Frank had obviously shared some crazy experiences when they had blacked out together, and they made some sort of deal. It also explained why even now, out of habit, Frank kept checking his coat pocket, why he was so nervous around fire. Still, Percy couldn't imagine what kind of courage it had taken for Frank to embark on a quest, knowing that one small flame could snuff out his life. Frank, he said, I'm proud to be related to you. Frank's ears turned red. When his head lowered, his military haircut made a sharp black arrow pointing down. Juno has some sort of plan for us, about the prophecy of seven. Yeah, Percy grumbled. I didn't like her as Hera. I didn't like her any better as Juno. Hazel tucked her feet underneath her. She studied Percy with her luminescent golden eyes, and he wondered how she could be so calm. She was the youngest one on the quest, but she was always holding them together and comforting them. Now they were flying to Alaska, where she had died once before. They would try to free Fanatos, who might take her back to the underworld, yet she didn't show any fear. It made Percy feel silly for being scared of aeroplane turbulence. You're a son of Poseidon, aren't you? she asked. You are a Greek demigod. Percy gripped his leather necklace. I started to remember in Portland, after the Gorgon's blood. It's been coming back to me slowly since then. There's another camp. Camp Half-Blood. Just saying the name made Percy feel warm inside. Good memory wa memories washed over him. The smell of strawberry fields in the warm summer sun. Fireworks lighting up the beach on the 4th of July. Satyrs playing panpipes at the nightly campfire. And a kiss at the bottom of the canoe lake. Hazel and Frank stared at him as though he'd slipped into another language. Another camp, Hazel repeated. A Greek camp? Gods, if Octavian found out, he'd declare war, Frank said. He's always been sure the Greeks were out there, plotting against us. He thought Percy was a spy. That's why Juno sent me, Percy said. Uh, I mean, not to spy. I think it was some kind of exchange. Your friend Jason. I think he was sent to my camp. In my dreams, I saw a demigod that might have been him. He was working with some other demigods on this flying warship. I think they're coming to Camp Jupiter to help. Frank tapped nervously on the back of his seat. Mars said Juno wants to unite the Greeks and Romans to fight Gaia. But geez, Greeks and Romans have a long history of bad blood. Hazel took a deep breath. That's probably why the gods have kept us apart this long. If a Greek warship appeared in the sky above Camp Jupiter and Rainer didn't know it was friendly. Yeah, Percy agreed. We've got to be careful how we explain this when we get back. If we get back, Frank said. Percy nodded reluctantly. I mean, I trust you guys. I hope you trust me. I feel very... I feel as close to you two as to any of my old friends at Camp Half-Blood, but with the other demigods at both camps, they're going to be, well, there's going to be a lot of suspicion. Hazel did something he wasn't expecting. She leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. It was totally a sisterly kiss, but she smiled with such affection that it warmed Percy right down to his feet. Of course we trust you, she said. We're a family now, aren't we, Frank? Sure, he said. Do I get a kiss? Hazel laughed, but there was nervous tension in it. Anyway, what do we do now? Percy took a deep breath. Time was slipping away. They were almost halfway through June 23rd, and tomorrow was the Feast of Fortuna. I've got to contact a friend to keep my promise to Ella. How? Frank said. One of those Iris messages? Still not working, Percy said sadly. I tried it last night at your grandmother's house. No luck. Maybe it's because my memories are still jumbled, or the gods aren't allowing a connection. I'm hoping I can contact my friend in my dreams. 
Another bump of turbulence made him grab his seat. Below them, snow-capped mountains broke through a blanket of clouds. I'm not sure I can sleep, Percy said, but I need to try. We can't leave Ella by herself with those ogres around. Yeah, Frank said. We've still got hours to fly. Take the couch, ma'am. Percy nodded. He felt lucky to have Hazel and Frank watching out for him. What he'd said to them was true. He trusted them. In the weird, terrifying, horrible experience of losing his memory and getting ripped out of his old life, Hazel and Frank were the bright spots. He stretched out, closed his eyes, and dreamed he was falling from a mountain of ice towards a cold sea. The dream shifted. He was back in Vancouver, standing in front of the ruins of the Zhang Mansion. The Lestrajonians were gone. The mansion was reduced to a burnt-out shell. A crew of firefighters was packing up their equipment, getting ready to move out. The lawn looked like a war zone with smoking craters and trenches from the blown-out irrigation pipes. At the edge of the forest, a giant shaggy black dog was bounding around sniffing the trees. The firefighters completely ignored him. Besides one of the craters knelt a cyclops in oversized jeans, boots and a massive flannel shirt. His messy brown hair was spattered with rain and mud. When he raised his head, his big brown eye was red from crying. Close, he moaned. So close, but gone. It broke Percy's heart to hear the pain and worry in the big guy's voice. But he knew they only had a few seconds to talk. The edges of the vision were already dissolving. If Alaska was the land beyond the gods, Percy figured the further north he went, the harder it would be to communicate with his friends, even in his dreams. Tyson, he called. The Cyclops looked around frantically. Percy? Brother? Tyson, I I'm okay. I'm here. Well, not really. Tyson grabbed the air like he was trying to catch butterflies. Can't see you. Where is my brother? Tyson, I'm flying to Alaska. I'm okay. I'll be back. Just find Ella. She's a harpy with red feathers. She's hiding in the woods around the house. Find a harpy? A red harpy? Yes, protect her, okay? She's my friend. Get her back to California. There's a demigod camp in the Oakland Hills. Camp Jupiter. Meet me above the Caldecott Tunnel. Oakland Hills, California, Caldecott Tunnel, he shouted to the dog. Mrs. O'Leary, we must find a harpy. Woof, said the dog. Tyson's face started to dissolve. My brother is okay. My brother is coming back. I miss you. I miss you too. Percy tried to keep his voice from cracking. I'll see you soon. Just be careful. There's a giant's army marching south. Tell Annabeth. The dream shifted. Percy found himself standing in the hills north of Camp Jupiter, looking down at the field of Mars and New Rome. At the legion's fort, horns were blowing. Campers scrambled to muster. The giant's army was arrayed to Percy's left and right. Centaurs with bull's horns, the six-armed earthborn and evil cyclopses in scrap metal armour. The Cyclops' siege tower cast a shadow across the feet of the giant Polybatus, who grinned down at the Roman camp. He paced eagerly across the hill, snakes dropping from his green dreadlocks, his dragon legs stomping down small trees. On his green-blue armour, the decorative faces of hungry monsters seemed to blink in the shadows. Yes, he chuckled, planting his trident in the ground. Blow your little horns, Romans. I've come to destroy you. Sveno! The Gorgon scrambled out of the bushes. Her lime-green viper hair and bargain-mart vest clashed horribly with the giant's colour scheme. Yes, master, she said. Would you like a puppy in a blanket? She held up a tray of free samples. Hmm. Bolopolibatus said. What sort of puppy? Ah, uh, they're not actually puppies. They're tiny hot dogs in crescent rolls, but they're on sale this week. Bah, never mind then. Are our forces ready to attack? Oh. Sveno stepped back quickly to avoid getting flattened by the giant's foot. Almost great one. Ma Gasket and half her cyclopses stopped in Napa. Something about a winery tour? They promised to be here by tomorrow evening. What? The giant looked around, as if just noticing that a big portion of his army was missing. Grr, that cyclops woman will give me an ulcer. Winery tour? I think there was cheese and crackers too, Sveno said helpfully. Though Bargain Mart has a much better deal. Polypatus ripped on an oak tree, out of the ground and threw it into the valley. Cyclops, I tell you, Svano, when I destroy Neptune and take over the oceans, we will renegotiate the Cyclops' labour contract. Ma Gasket will learn her place. Now, what news from the north? The demigods have left for Alaska, Svano said. They fly straight to their death. Ah, uh, small D death, I mean. Not our prisoner death, although I suppose they're flying to him too. Polypatus growled. Alsonius had better spare the son of Neptune as he promised. I want that one chained at my feet so I can kill him when the time is ripe. His blood shall water the stones of Mount Olympus and wake the Earth Mother. What word from the Amazons? Only silence, Sveno said. We do not yet know the winner of last night's duel, but it is only a matter of time before Otrera prevails and comes to our aid. Hmm. Polypatus 
absently scratch some vipers out of his hair. Perhaps it's just as well we wait then. Tomorrow at sundown in Fortuna's feast, by then we must invade, Amazons or no. In the meantime, dig in. We set up camp here on high ground. Yes, great one, Sveno announced to the troops. Puppies in blankets for anyone? The monsters cheered. Polypotus spread his hands in front of him, taking in the valley like a panoramic picture. Yes, blow your little horns, demigods. Soon the legacy of Rome will be destroyed for the last time. The dream faded. Percy woke with a jolt as the plane started its descent. Hazel laid her hand on his shoulder. Sleep okay? Percy sat up groggily. How long was I out? Frank stood in the aisle, wrapping his spear and new bow in his ski bag. A few hours, he said. We're almost there. Percy looked out of the window. A glittering inlet of the sea snaked between snowy mountains. In the distance, a city was carved out of the wilderness, surrounded by lush green forests on one side and icy black beaches on the other. Welcome to Alaska, Hazel said. We're beyond the help of the gods. Chapter 38. Percy. The pilots said the plane couldn't wait for them. But that was okay with Percy. If they survived till the next day, he hoped they could find a different way back. Anything but a plane. He should have been depressed. He was stuck in Alaska, the giant's home territory, out of contact with his old friends, just as his memories were coming back. He had seen an image of Polybatus's army, about to invade Camp Jupiter. He'd learned that the giants planned to use him as some kind of blood sacrifice to awaken Gaia. Plus, tomorrow evening was the Feast of Fortuna. He, Frank and Hazel had an impossible task to complete before then. At best, they would unleash death who might take Percy's two friends to the underworld. Not much to look forward to. Still, Percy felt strangely invigorated. His dream of Tyson had lifted his spirits. He remembered Tyson, his brother. They'd fought together, celebrated victories, shared good times at Camp Halfblood. He remembered his home, and that gave him a new determination to succeed. He was fighting for two camps now, two families. Juno had stolen his memory and sent him to Camp Jupiter for a reason. He understood that now. He still wanted to pun punch her in her godly face, but at least he got her reasoning. If the two camps could work together, they stood a chance of stopping their mutual enemies. Separately, both camps were doomed. There were other reasons Percy wanted to save Camp Jupiter, reasons he didn't dare put into words, not yet anyway. Suddenly he saw a future for himself and for Annabeth that he'd never imagined before. As they took a taxi into downtown Anchorage, Percy told Frank and Hazel about his dreams. They looked anxious, but not surprised when he told them about the giant's army closing in on camp. Frank choked, when he heard about Tyson. You have a half-brother who's a cyclops? Sure, Percy said, which makes him your great, uh, great, great. Please, Frank covered his ears, enough. As long as he can get Ella to camp, Hazel said, I'm worried about her. Percy nodded. He was still thinking about the lines of prophecy the harp he had recited, about the son of Neptune drowning and the mark of Athena burning through Rome. He wasn't sure what the first part meant, but he was starting to have an idea about the second. He tried to set the question aside. He had to survive this quest first. The taxi turned on Highway 1, which looked more like a small street to Percy, took them north towards downtown. It was late afternoon, but the sun was still high in the sky. Can't believe how much this place has grown, Hazel muttered. The taxi driver grinned in the rearview mirror. Been a long time since you visited, miss. About 70 years, Hazel said. The driver slid the glass partition closed and drove on in silence. According to Hazel, almost none of the buildings were the same, but she pointed out features of the landscape. The vast forests, forests ringing the city, the cold grey waters of Cook Inlet tracing the north edge of town, and the Chugak Mountains rising greyish-blue in the distance, capped with, with snow, even in June. Percy had never smelled air this clean before. The town itself had a weather-beaten look to it, with closed stores, rusted-out cars and worn apartment complexes lining the road, but it was still beautiful. Lakes and huge stretches of woods cut through the middle. The Arctic sky was an amazing combination of turquoise and gold. Then... There were the giants. Dozens of bright blue men, each thirty feet tall, with grey frosty hair, and they were wading through the forests, fishing in the bay, striding across the mountains. The mortals didn't seem to notice them. The taxi passed within a few yards of one, who was sitting at the edge of a lake, washing his feet, but the driver didn't panic. Um, Frank pointed at the blue guy. Hyperboreans, Percy said. He was amazed he remembered the name. Northern giants. I fought some with Kronos when he invaded Manhattan. Wait, Frank said, when who did what? Long story, but <clears throat> these guys look, I don't know, peaceful. They usually are, Hazel agreed. I remember them. They're everywhere in Alaska, like bears. Bears, Frank said nervously. The giants are invisible to mortals, Hazel said. They never bothered me, though one almost stepped on me by accident once. That sounded fairly bothersome to Percy, but the taxi kept driving. 
None of the giants paid them any attention. One stood right at the intersection of Northern Lights Road, straddling the highway, and they drove between his legs. The Hyperborean was cradling a Native American totem pole wrapped in furs, humming to it like a baby. If the guy hadn't been the size of a building, he would have been almost cute. The taxi drove through downtown, past a bunch of tourists, shops advertising furs, Native American art and gold. Percy hoped Hazel wouldn't get agitated and make the jewellery shops explode. As the driver turned and headed towards the seashore, Hazel knocked on the glass partition. Here is good. Can you let us out? They paid the driver and stepped onto 4th Street. Compared to Vancouver, downtown Anchorage was tiny, more like a college campus than a city. But Hazel looked amazed. It's huge, she said. That, that's where the Gitchell Hotel used to be. My mum and I stayed there on our, our first week in Alaska. And they've moved City Hall. It used to be there. She led them in a daze for a few blocks. They didn't really have a plan beyond finding the fastest way to the Hubbard Glacier, but Percy smelled something cooking nearby. Sausage, maybe. He realised he hadn't eaten since that morning at Grandma Zhang's. Food, he said. Come on. They found a cafe right by the beach. It was bustling with people, but they scored a table at the window and perused the menus. Frank whooped with delight. 24-hour breakfast. It's like dinner time, Percy said, though he couldn't tell from looking outside. The sun was so high, it could have been noon. I love breakfast, Frank said. I'd eat breakfast, breakfast and breakfast if I could, though um, I'm sure the food here isn't as good as Hazel's. Hazel elbowed him, but her smile was playful. Seeing them like that made Percy happy. Those two definitely needed to get together, but it also made him sad. He thought about Annabeth and wondered if he'd live long enough to see her again. Think positive, he told himself. You know, he said, breakfast sounds great. They all ordered massive plates of eggs, pancakes and reindeer sausage, though Frank looked a little worried about the reindeer. You think it's okay that we're eating Rudolph? Dude, Percy said, I could eat Prancer and Blitzen too. I'm hungry. The food was excellent. Percy had never seen anyone eat as fast as Frank. The red-nosed reindeer did not stand a chance. Between bites of blueberry pancake, Hazel drew a squiggly curve and an X on her napkin. So this is what I'm thinking. We're here, she said. X, Anchorage. It looks like a seagull's face, Percy said. And we're the eye. Hazel glared at him. It's a map, Percy. Anchorage is at the top of this sliver of ocean. Coke Inlet. Cook Inlet. There's a big peninsula of land below us. And my old hometown, Seward, is at the bottom of the peninsula. Here. She drew another X at the base of the seagull's throat. That's the closest town to the Hubbard Glacier. We could go around by sea, I guess, but it would take forever. We don't have that kind of time. Frank polished off the last of his Rudolph. But land is dangerous, he said. Land means Gaia. Hazel nodded. I don't see that we've got much choice, though. We could have asked our pilot to fly us down, but I don't know. His plane might be too big for the little Seward airport. And if we chartered another plane? No more planes, Percy said. Please. Hazel held up her hand in a placating gesture. It's okay. There's a train that goes from here to Seward. We might be able to catch one tonight. It only takes a couple of hours. She drew a dotted line between the two X's. You just cut off the seagull's head, Percy noted. Hazel sighed. It's the train line. Look, from Seward, the Hubbard Glacier is down here somewhere. She tapped the lower right corner of the napkin. That's where Alsonius is. But you're not sure how far, Frank asked. Hazel frowned and shook her head. I'm pretty sure it's only accessible by boat or plane. Boat, Percy said immediately. Fine, Hazel said. Shouldn't be too far from Seward, if we can get to Seward safely. Percy gazed out of the window. So much to do, and only 24 hours left. This time tomorrow, the Feast of Fortuna would be starting. Unless they unleashed death and made it back to camp, the giant's army would flood into the valley. The Romans would be the main course at a monster dinner. Across the street, a frosty black sand beach led down to the sea, which was as smooth as steel. The ocean here felt different, still powerful but freezing, slow and primal. No gods controlled that water, at least no gods Percy knew. Neptune wouldn't be able to protect him. Percy wondered if he could ever manipulate water here or breathe underwater. A Hyperborean giant lumbered across the street. Nobody in the cafe noticed. The giant stepped into the bay, cracking the ice under his sandals, and thrust his hands in the water. He brought out a killer whale in one fist. Apparently that wasn't what he wanted, because he threw the whale back and kept wading. Good breakfast, Frank said. Who's ready for a train ride? The station wasn't far. They were just in time to buy tickets for the last train south. As his friends climbed on board, Percy said, Be with you in a sec, and ran back into the station. He got change from the gift shop and stood in front of the payphone. He never used to used a payphone before. They were strange antiques to him, like his mum's turntable or his teacher Chiron's Frank Sinatra cassette tapes. 
He wasn't sure how many coins it would take, or if he could even make the call go through, assuming he remembered the number correctly. Sally Jackson, he thought. That was his mum's name, and he had a stepdad, Paul. What did they think had happened to Percy? Maybe they had already held a memorial service. As near as he could figure, he'd lost seven months of his life. Sure, most of that had been during the school year, but still, not cool. He picked up the receiver and punched in a New York number, his mum's apartment. Voicemail. Percy should have figured. It would be like midnight in New York. They wouldn't recognise this number. Hearing Paul's voice on the recording hit Percy in the gut so hard, he could barely speak at the tone. Mum, he said. Hey, I'm alive. Hera put me to sleep for a while, and then she took my memory and... His voice faltered. How he could possibly explain all this? Anyway, I'm okay. I'm sorry. I'm on a quest. He winced. He shouldn't have said that. His mum knew all about quests, and now she'd be worried. I'll make it home, I promise. Love you. He put down the receiver. He stared at the phone, hoping it would ring back. The train whistle sounded. The conductor shouted, All aboard! Percy ran. He made it just as they were pulling up the steps and then climbed to the top of the double-decker car and slid into his seat. Hazel frowned. You okay? Yeah, he croaked. Just made a call. She and Frank seemed to get that. They didn't ask for details. Soon they were heading south along the coast, watching the landscape go by. Percy tried to think about the quest, but for an ADHD kid like him, the train wasn't the easiest place to concentrate. Cool things kept happening outside. Bald eagles soared overhead. The train raced over bridges and along cliffs where glacial waterfalls tumbled thousands of feet down the rocks. They passed forests, buried in snowdrifts, big artillery guns to set off small avalanches and prevent uncontrolled ones. Hazel explained, and lakes so clear they reflected the mountains like mirrors, so the world looks up, looked upside down. Brown bears lumbered through the meadows. Hyperborean giants kept appearing in the strangest places. One was lounging in a lake, like it was a hot tub. Another was using a pine tree as a toothpick. A third sat in a snowdrift, playing with two live moose like they were action figures. The train was full of tourists, ooing and ahhing and snapping pictures. But Percy felt sorry they couldn't see the Hyperboreans. They were missing the really good shots. Meanwhile, Frank studied a map of Alaska that he'd found in the seat pocket. He located Hubbard Glacier, which looked discouragingly far away from Seward. He kept running his finger along the coastline, frowning with concentration. What are you thinking? Percy asked. Just possibilities, Frank said. Percy didn't know what that meant, but he let it go. After about an hour, Percy started to, started to relax. They bought hot chocolate from the dining car. The seats were warm and comfortable, and he thought about taking a nap. Then a shadow passed overhead. Tourists murmured in excitement and started taking pictures. Eagle, one yelled. Eagle, said another. Huge eagle, said a third. That's no eagle, Frank said. Percy looked up just in time to see the creature make a second pass. It was definitely larger than an eagle, with a sleek black body the size of a Labrador retriever. Its wingspan was at least ten feet across. There's another one, Frank pointed. Strike that three, four. Okay, we're in trouble. The creatures circled the train like vultures, delighting the tourists. Percy wasn't delighted. The monsters had glowing red eyes, sharp beaks and vicious talons. Percy felt for his pen in his pocket. Those things looked familiar. Seattle, Hazel, Hazel said. The Amazons had one in a cage. There. Then several things happened at once. The emergency brakes screeched, pitching them forward. Tourists screamed and tumbled through the aisles. The monsters swooped down, shattering the glass roof of the car, and the entire train toppled off the rails. Chapter 39. Percy. Percy went weightless, his vision blurred. Claws grabbed his arms and lifted him into the air. Below, train wheels squealed and metal crashed. Glass shattered. Passengers screamed. When his eyesight cleared, he saw the beast that was carrying him aloft. It had the body of a panther, sleek, black and feline, with the wings and head of an eagle. Its eyes glowed blood red. Percy squirmed. The monster's front talons were wrapped around his arms like steel bands. He couldn't free himself or reach his sword. He rose higher and higher in the cold wind. Percy had no idea where the monster was taking him, but he was pretty sure he wouldn't like it when he got there. He yelled, mostly out of frustration. Then something whistled by his ear. An arrow sprouted from the monster's neck. The creature shrieked and let go. Percy fell, crashing through tree branches until he slammed into a snowbank. He groaned, looking up at a massive pine tree he'd just shredded. He managed to stand. Nothing seemed broken. Frank stood to his left, shooting down the creatures as fast as he could. Hazel was at his back, swinging her sword at any monster that came close. But there were too many swarming around them, at least a dozen. Percy drew Riptide. He sliced the wing off one monster and sent it spiralling into a tree. 
then sliced through another that burst into dust. But the defeated ones began to reform immediately. What are these things? he yelled. Griffins, Hazel said. We have to get them away from the train. Percy saw what she meant. The train cars had fallen over and their roofs had shattered. Tourists were stumbling around in shock. Percy didn't see anybody seriously injured, but the griffins were swooping towards anything that moved. The only thing keeping them away from the mortals was a glowing grey warrior in camouflage. Frank's pet, Spartus. Percy glanced over and noticed Frank's spear was gone. Used your last charge? Yep. Frank shot another griffin out of the sky. Had to help the mortals. The spear just dissolved. Percy nodded. Part of him was relieved. He didn't like the skeleton warrior. Part of him was disappointed because that was one less weapon they had at their disposal. But he didn't fault Frank. Frank had done the right thing. Let's move the fight, Percy said, away from the tracks. They stumbled through the snow, smacking and slicing griffins that reformed from dust every time they were killed. Percy had no experience with griffins. He'd always imagined them as huge noble animals, like lions with wings, but these things reminded him more of a vicious pack hunters, flying hyenas. About fifty yards from the tracks, the trees gave way to an open marsh. The ground was so spongy and icy, Percy felt like he was racing across bubble wrap. Frank was running out of arrows. Hazel was breathing hard. Percy's own sword swings were getting slower. He realised they were alive only because the griffins weren't trying to kill them. The griffins wanted to pick them up and carry them off somewhere. Maybe to their nests, Percy thought. Then he tripped over something in the tall grass. A circle of scrap metal about the size of a tractor tyre. It was a massive bird's nest. A griffin's nest. The bottom littered with old pieces of jewellery. An imperial gold dagger. A dented centurion's badge. And two pumpkin-sized eggs that looked like real gold. Percy jumped into the nest. He pressed his sword tip against one of the eggs. Back off, or I break it. The griffins squawked angrily. They buzzed around the nest and snapped their beaks, but they didn't attack. Hazel and Frank stood back to back with Percy, their weapons ready. Griffins collect gold, Hazel said. They're crazy for it. Look, more nests over there. Frank knocked his last arrow. So, if these are their nests, where are they trying to take Percy? That thing was flying away with him. Percy's arms still throbbed where the griffin had grabbed him. Alsonius, he guessed. Maybe they're working for him. Are these things smart enough to take orders? I don't know, Hazel said. I never fought, for, fought them when I lived here. I just read about them at camp. Weaknesses, Frank asked. Please tell me they have weaknesses. Hazel scowled. Horses. They hate horses. Natural enemies or something. I wish Arian was here. The griffin shrieked. They swirled around the nest with the red eyes glowing. Guys, Frank said nervously. I see legion relics in this nest. I know, Percy said. That means other demigods died here or... Frank, it'll be okay, Percy promised. One of the griffins dived in. Percy raised his sword, ready to stab the egg. The monster veered off, but the other griffins were losing their patience. Percy couldn't keep this standoff going much longer. He glanced around the fields, desperately trying to formulate a plan. About a quarter mile away, a hyperborean giant was sitting in the bog, peacefully picking mud from between his toes with a broken tree trunk. I've got an idea, Percy said. Hazel, all the gold in these nests, do you think they can use it? Well, do you think you could use it to cause a distraction? I... I guess. Just give us enough time for a head start. When I say go, run for that giant. Frank gaped to him. You want us to run towards a giant? Trust me, Percy said. Ready? Go. Hazel thrust her hand upward. From a dozen nests or across the marsh, golden objects shot, in, shot into the air. Jewellery, weapons, coins, gold nuggets, and most importantly, griffin eggs. The monsters shrieked and flew after their eggs, frantic to save them. Percy and his friends ran. Their feet splashed and crunched through the frozen marsh. Percy poured on speed, but he could hear the griffins closing behind them, and now the monsters were really angry. The giant hadn't noticed the commotion yet. He was inspecting his toes for mud, his face sleepy and peaceful, his white whiskers glistening with ice crystals. Around his neck was a necklace of found objects, garbage cans, car doors, moose antlers, camping equipment, even a toilet. Apparently he'd been cleaning up the wilderness. Percy hated to disturb him, especially since it meant taking shelter under the giant's thighs, but they didn't have much choice. Under, he told his friends, crawl under. They scrambled between the massive blue legs and flattened themselves in the mud, crawling as close as they could to his loincloth. Percy tried to breathe through his mouth, but it wasn't the most pleasant hiding spot. What's the plan? Frank hissed. Get flattened by a blue rump? Lay low, Percy said. Only move if you have to. 
The griffins arrived in a wave of angry beaks, talons and wings, swarming around the giant, trying to get under his legs. The giant rumbled in surprise. He shifted. Percy had to roll to avoid getting crushed by his large hairy rear. The Hyperborean grunted, a little more irritated. He swatted at the griffins, but they squawked in outrage and began pecking at his legs and hands. Rawr! The giant bellowed. Rawr! He took a deep breath and blew out a wave of cold air. Even under the protection of the giant's legs, Percy could feel the temperature drop. The griffins shrieked, stopped, shrieking stopped abruptly, replaced by the funk, funk, funk of heavy objects hitting the mud. Come on, Percy told his friends, carefully. They squirmed out from under the giant. All around the marsh, trees were glazed with frost. A huge swathe of the bog was covered in fresh snow. Frozen griffins stuck out of the ground like feathery popsicle sticks. Their wings still spread, beaks open, eyes wide with surprise. Percy and his friends scrambled away, trying to keep out of the giant's vision, but the big guy was too busy to notice them. He was trying to figure out how to string a frozen griffin onto his necklace. Percy. Hazel wiped the ice and mud from her face. How did you know the giant could do that? I almost got hit by Hyperborean breath once, he said. We'd better move. The griffins won't stay frozen forever. Chapter 40. Percy. They walked overland for about an hour, keeping the train tracks in sight, but staying in the cover of the trees as much as possible. Once they heard a helicopter flying in the direction of the train wreck. Twice they heard the screech of griffins, but they sounded a long way off. As near as Percy could figure, it was about midnight when the sun finally set. It got cold in the woods. The stars were so thick, Percy was tempted to stop and gawk at them. Then the northern lights cranked up. They reminded Percy of his mum's gas stovetop back home, when she had the flame on low. Waves of ghostly blue flames rippling back and forth. That's amazing, Frank said. Bears, Hazel pointed. Sure enough, a couple of brown bears were lumbering in the meadow a few hundred feet away, their coats gleaming in the starlight. They won't bother us, Hazel promised. Just give them a wide berth. Percy and Frank didn't argue. As they trudged on, Percy thought about all the crazy places he'd seen. None of them had left him speechless like Alaska. He could see why it was a land beyond the gods. Everything here was rough and untamed. There were no rules, no prophecies, no destinies. Just the harsh wilderness and a bunch of animals and monsters. Mortals and demigods came here at their own risk. Percy wondered if this was what Gaia wanted, for the whole world to be like this. He wondered if that would be such a bad thing. Then he put the thought aside. Gaia wasn't a gentle goddess. Percy had heard what she planned to do. She wasn't like the Mother Earth you might read about in children's fairy tales. She was vengeful and violent. If she ever woke up fully, she'd destroy human civilization. After another couple of hours, they stumbled across a tiny village between the railroad tracks and a two-lane road. The city limit sign said, Moose Pass. Standing next to the sign was an actual moose. For a second, Percy thought it might be some sort of statue for advertising. Then the animal bounded into the woods. They passed a couple of houses, a post office and some trailers. Everything was dark and closed up. On the other end of town was a store with a picnic table and an old rusted petrol pump in front. The store had a hand-painted sign that read, Moose Pass Gas. That's just wrong, Frank said. By silent agreement, they collapsed around the picnic table. Percy's feet felt like blocks of ice, very sore blocks of ice. Hazel put her head in her hands and passed out, snoring. Frank took out his last sodas and some granola bars from the train ride and shared them with Percy. They ate in silence, watching the stars, until Frank said, Did you mean what you said earlier? Percy looked across the table. About what? In the starlight, Frank's face might have been a black alabaster, like an old Roman statue. About being proud that we're related. Percy tapped his granola bar on the table. Well, let's see. You single-handedly took out three basilisks while I was sipping green tea and wheat germ. You held off an army of Lestrogonians so that our plane could take off in Vancouver. You saved my life by shooting down that griffin, and you gave up the last charge on your magic spear to help some defenceless mortals. You are, hands down, the nicest child of the war god I've ever met. Maybe the only nice one, so what do you think? Frank stared up at the northern lights, still cooking across the stars on low heat. It's just, I was supposed to be in charge of this quest. The Centurion and all. I feel like you guys have had to carry me. Not true, Percy said. I'm supposed to have these powers. Haven't figured out how to use, Frank said bitterly. Now I don't have a spear and I'm almost out of arrows. And I'm scared. I'd be worried if you, worried if you weren't scared, Percy said. We're all scared. But the Feast of Fortuna is... Frank thought about it. It's after midnight, isn't it? That means it's June 24th now. The feast starts tonight at sundown. 
We have to find our way to Hubbard Glacier, defeat a giant who is undefeatable in his home territory, and get back to Camp Jupiter before they're overrun, all in less than 18 hours. And when we free Fanatos, Percy said, he might claim your life. And Hazel's. Believe me, I've been thinking about it. Frank gazed at Hazel, still snoring lightly. Her face was buried under a mass of curly brown hair. She's my best friend, Frank said. I lost my mum, my grandmother. I can't lose her too. Percy thought about his old life. His mum in New York, Camp Halfblood, Annabeth. He'd lost all of that for eight months. Even now, with the memories coming back, he'd never been this far away from home before. He'd been to the underworld and back. He'd faced death dozens of times. But sitting at this picnic table, thousands of miles away, beyond the power of Olympus, he'd never been so alone, except for Hazel and Frank. I'm not going to lose either of you, he promised. I'm not going to let that happen. And Frank, you are a leader. Hazel would say the same thing. We need you. Frank lowered his head. He seemed lost in thought. Finally, he leaned forward until his head bumped the picnic table. He started to snore in harmony with Hazel. Percy sighed. Another inspiring speech from Jackson, he said to himself. Rest up, Frank. Big day ahead. At dawn, the store opened up. The owner was a little surprised to find three teenagers crashed out on the picnic table, but when Percy explained that they had stumbled away from last night's train wreck, the guy felt sorry for them and treated them to breakfast. He called a friend of his, an Inuit native, who had a cabin close to Seward. Soon, they were rumbling along the road in a beat-up forward pickup that had been new about the time Hazel was born. Hazel and Frank sat in the back, but Percy rode up front with a leathery old man who smelled like smoked salmon. He told Percy stories about Bear and Raven, the Inuit gods, and all Percy could think was that he hoped he didn't meet them. He had enough enemies already. The truck broke down a few miles outside Seward. The driver didn't seem surprised, as though this happened to him several times a day. He said they could wait for him to fix the engine, but since Seward was only a few miles away, they decided to walk it. By mid-morning, they climbed over a rise in the road and saw a small bay ringed with mountains. The town was a thin crescent on the right-hand shore, with wharves extending into the water and a cruise ship in the harbour. Percy shuddered. He'd had bad experiences with cruise ships. Seward, Hazel said. She didn't sound happy to see her old home. They'd already lost a lot of time and Percy didn't like how fast the sun was rising. The road curved round the hillside, but it looked like they could get to town faster going straight across the meadows. Percy stepped off the road. Come on. The ground was squishy, but he didn't think much about it until Hazel shouted, Percy, no. His next step went straight through the ground. He sank like a stone until the earth closed over his head and the earth swallowed him. Chapter 41. Hazel. Your bow, Hazel shouted. Frank didn't ask questions. He dropped his pack and slipped the bow off his shoulder. Hazel's heart raced. She hadn't thought about this boggy soil, muskeg, since before she had died. Now, too late, she remembered the dire warnings the locals had given her. Marshy silt and decomposed plants made a surface that looked completely solid, but it was even worse than quicksand. It could be twenty feet deep or more and impossible to escape. She tried not to think what would happen if it were deeper than the length of the bow. Hold one, ha one end, she told Frank. Don't let go. She grabbed the other end, took a deep breath and jumped into the bog. The earth closed over her head. Instantly, she was frozen in a memory. Not now. She wanted to scream. Ella said I was done with blackouts. Oh, but my dear, said the voice of Gaia, this is not one of your blackouts. This is a gift from me. Hazel was back in New Orleans. She and her mother sat in the park near their apartment, having a picnic breakfast. She remembered this day. She was seven years old. Her mother had just told Hazel's, sold Hazel's first precious stone, a small diamond. Neither of them had yet realised Hazel's curse. Queen Marie was in an excellent mood. She had bought orange juice for Hazel and champagne for herself and fritters sprinkled with chocolate and powdered sugar. She'd even bought Hazel a new box of crayons and a pad of paper. They sat together, Queen Marie humming cheerfully while Hazel drew pictures. The French Quarter woke up around them, ready for Mardi Gras. Jazz bands practised, floats were being decorated with fresh-cut flowers, children laughed and chased each other, decked in so many coloured necklaces they could barely walk. The sunrise turned the sky to red gold, and the warm, steamy air smelled of magnolias and roses. It had been the happiest morning of Hazel's life. You could stay here, her mother smiled, but her eyes were blank white. The voice was Gaia's. This is fake, Hazel said. She tried to get up, but the soft bed of grass made her lazy and sleepy. The smell of baked bread and melting chocolate was intoxicating. 
It was the morning of Mardi Gras and the world seemed full of possibilities. Hazel could almost believe she had a bright future. What is real? asked Gaia, speaking through her mother's face. Is your second life real, Hazel? You're supposed to be dead. Is it real that you're sinking into a bog, suffocating? Let me help my friend. Hazel tried to force herself back to reality. She could imagine her hand clenched on the end of the bow, but even that was starting to feel fuzzy. Her grip was loosening. The smell of magnolias and roses was overpowering. Her mother offered her a fritter. No, Hazel thought. This isn't my mother. This is Gaia tricking me. You want your old life back, Gaia said. I can give you that. This moment can last for years. You can grow up in New Orleans and your mother will adore you. You'll never have to deal with the burden of your curse. You can be with Sammy. It's an illusion, Hazel said, choking on the sweet scent of flowers. You are an illusion, Hazel Levesque. You were only brought back to life because the gods have a task for you. I may have used you, but Nico used you and lied about it. You should be glad I captured him. Captured? A feeling of panic rose in Hazel's chest. What do you mean? Gaia smiled, sipping her champagne. The boy should have known better than to search for the doors. But no matter, it's not really your concern. Once you release Fanatos, you'll be thrown back into the underworld to rot forever. Frank and Percy won't stop that from happening. Would real friends ask you to give up your life? Tell me who is lying and who tells you the truth. Hazel started to cry. Bitterness welled up inside her. She'd lost her life once. She didn't want to die again. That's right, Gaia purred. You were destined to marry Sammy. Do you know what happened to him after you died in Alaska? He grew up and moved to Texas. He married and had a family. But he never forgot you. He always wondered why you disappeared. He's dead now. A heart attack in the 1960s. The life you could have had together always haunted him. Stop it, Hazel screamed. You took that from me. And you can have it again, Gaia said. I have you in my embrace, Hazel. You'll die anyway. If you give up, at least I can take it... Well, I can make it pleasant for you. Forget saving Percy Jackson. He belongs to me. I'll keep him safe in the earth until I'm ready to use him. You can have an entire life in your final moments. You can grow up, marry Sammy. All you have to do is let go. Hazel tightened her grip on the bow. Below her, something grabbed her ankles, but she didn't panic. She knew it was Percy, suffocating, desperately grasping for a chance at life. Hazel glared at the goddess. I'll never cooperate with you. Let. Us. Go. Her mother's face dissolved. The New Orleans morning melted into darkness. Hazel was drowning in mud. One hand on the bow, Percy's hands around her ankles, deep in the darkness. Hazel wriggled the end of the bow frantically. Frank pulled her up with such force it nearly popped her arm out of her socket. When she opened her eyes, she was lying in the grass, covered in muck. Percy sprawled at her feet, coughing and spitting mud. Frank hovered over them, yelling, Oh gods! Oh gods! Oh gods! He yanked some extra clothes from his bag and started toweling off Hazel's face, but it didn't do much good. He dragged Percy further from the muskeg. You were down there so long, Frank cried. I didn't think, oh gods, don't ever do something like that again. He wrapped Hazel in a bear hug. Can't breathe, she choked out. Sorry. Frank went back to the toweling and fussing over them. Finally, he got them to the side of the road where they sat and shivered and spat up mud clods. Hazel couldn't feel her hands. She wasn't sure if she was cold or in shock, but she managed to explain about the muskeg and the vision she'd seen while she was under. Not the part about Sammy. That was still too painful to say out loud. But she told them about Gaia's offer of a fake life and the goddess's claim that she'd captured her brother, Nico. Hazel didn't want to keep that to herself. She was afraid the despair would overwhelm her. Percy rubbed his shoulders. His lips were blue. You, you saved me, Hazel. We'll figure out what happened to Nico. I promise. Hazel squinted at the sun, which was now high in the sky. The warmth felt good, but it didn't stop her trembling. Does it seem like Gaia let us go too easily? Percy plucked a mud clod from his hair. Maybe she still wants us as pawns. Maybe she was just saying things to mess with your mind. She knew what to say, Hazel agreed. She knew how to get to me. Frank put his jacket around her shoulders. This is a real life. You know that, right? We're not going to let you die again. He sounded so determined. Hazel didn't want to argue, but she didn't see how Frank could stop death. She pressed her coat pocket, where Frank's half-burnt firewood was still securely wrapped. She wondered what would have happened to him if she'd sunk in the mud forever. Maybe that would have saved him. Fire couldn't have got to the wood down there. She would have made any sacrifice to keep Frank safe. Perhaps she hadn't always felt that strongly, but Frank had trusted her with his life. He believed in her. She couldn't bear the thought of any harm coming to him. She glanced at the rising sun. Time was running out. 
She thought about Hilla, the Amazon queen back in Seattle. Hilla would have dueled Ortrera two nights in a row by now, assuming she had survived. She was counting on Hazel to release death. She managed to stand. The wind coming off Resurrection Bay was just as cold as she remembered. We should get going. We're losing time. Percy gazed down the road. His lips were returning to their normal colour. Any hotels or something where we could clean off? I mean, hotels that accept mud people? I'm not sure, Hazel admitted. She looked at the town below, couldn't believe how much it had grown since 1942. The main harbour had moved east as the town had expanded. Most of the buildings were new to her, but the grid of downtown streets seemed familiar. She thought she recognised some warehouses along the shore. I might know a place where we can freshen up. Chapter 42. Hazel. When they got into town, Hazel followed the same route she'd used 70 years ago, the last night of her life, when she'd come home from the hills and found her mother missing. She led her friends along 3rd Avenue. The railroad station was still there. The big white two-storey Seward Hotel was still in business, though it had expanded to twice its old size. They thought about stopping there, but Hazel didn't think it would be a good idea to traipse into the lobby covered in mud, nor was she sure the hotel would give a room to free miners. Instead, they turned towards the shoreline. Hazel couldn't believe it, but her old home was still there, leaning over the water on barnacle-encrusted piers. The roof sagged, the walls were perforated with holes like buckshot, the door was boarded up, and a hand-painted sign read, Rooms, Storage, Available. Come on, she said. Uh, you sure it's safe? Frank asked. Hazel found an open window and climbed inside. Her friends followed. The room hadn't been used in a long time. Their feet kicked up dust that swirled in the buckshot beams of sunlight. Mouldering cardboard boxes were stacked along the walls. Their faded labels read, greeting cards, assorted seasonal. Why several hundred boxes of season's greetings had wound up crumbling to dust in a warehouse in Alaska, Hazel had no idea, but it felt like a cruel joke, as if the cards were for all the holidays she'd never got to celebrate. Decades of Christmases, Easter's, birthdays, Valentine's days. It's warmer in here, at least, Frank said. Guess no running water? Maybe I can go shopping. I'm not as muddy as you guys. I could find, so find us some clothes. Hazel only half heard him. She climbed over a stack of boxes in the corner that used to be her sleeping area. An old sign was propped against the wall. Gold prospecting supplies. She thought she'd find, find a bare wall behind it. But when she moved the sign, most of her photos and drawings were still pinned there. The sign must have protected them from sunlight and the elements. They seemed not to have aged. Her crayon drawings of New Orleans looked so childish. Had she really made them? Her mother stared out at her from one photograph, smiling in front of her business sign. Queen Marie's Grigri. Charms sold. Fortunes told. Next to that was a photo of Sammy at the carnival. He was frozen in time with his crazy grin, his curly black hair and those beautiful eyes. If Gaia was telling the truth, Sammy had been dead for over 40 years. Had he really remembered Hazel all that time? Or had he forgotten the peculiar girl he used to go riding with? The girl who shared one kiss and a birthday cupcake with him before disappearing forever. Frank's fingers hovered over the photo. Who? He saw that she was crying and clamped back his question. Sorry, Hazel, this must be really hard. Do you want some time? No, she croaked. No, it's fine. Is that your mother? Percy pointed to the photo of Queen Marie. She looks like you. She's beautiful. Then Percy studied the picture of Sammy. Who is that? Hazel didn't understand why he looked so spooked. That's... That's Sammy. He was my uh, friend from New Orleans. She forced him herself not to look at Frank. I've seen him before, Percy said. You couldn't have, Hazel said. That was in 1941. He's, he's probably dead now. Percy frowned. I guess, still. He shook his head like the thought was too uncomfortable. Frank cleared his throat. Look, we passed the store on the last block. We've got a little money left. Maybe I should go get you guys some food and clothes. I don't know. A hundred boxes of wet wipes or something? Hazel put the gold prospecting sign back over her mementos. She felt guilty even looking at that old picture of Sammy, with Frank trying to be so sweet and supportive. It didn't do her any good to think about her old life. That would be great, she said. You're the best, Frank. The floorboards creaked under his feet. Well, I'm the only one not completely covered in mud anyway. Be back soon. Once he was gone, Percy and Hazel made temporary camp. They took off their jackets and tried to scrape off the mud. They found some old blankets in a crate and used them to clean up. They discovered that boxes of greeting cards made pretty good places to rest if you arranged them like mattresses. Percy set his sword on the floor where it glowed with a faint bronze light, and then he stretched out on a bed of Merry Christmas, 1982. Thank you for saving me, he said. I should have told you that earlier. 
Hazel shrugged. You would have done the same for me. Yes, he agreed. But when I was down in the mud, I remembered that line from Ella's prophecy about the son of Neptune drowning. I thought, this is what it means. I'm drowning in the earth. I was sure I was dead. His voice quavered like it had his first day at Camp Jupiter when Hazel had shown him the shrine of Neptune. Back then she had wondered if Percy was the answer to her problems, the descendant of Neptune that Pluto had promised would take her away and take her curse some day. Percy had seemed so intimidating and powerful, like a real hero. Only now she knew that Frank was the descendant of Neptune too. Frank wasn't the most impressive looking hero in the world, but he trusted her with his life. He tried so hard to protect her. Even his clumsiness was endearing. She'd never felt more confused. And since she had spent her whole life confused, that was saying a lot. Percy, she said, that prophecy might not have been complete. Frank thought Ella was remembering a burnt page. Maybe you'll drown someone else. He looked at her cautiously. You think so? Hazel felt strange reassuring him. He was so much older and more in command, but she nodded confidently. You're going to make it back home. You're going to see your girlfriend, Annabeth. You'll make it back too, Hazel, he insisted. We're not going to let anything happen to you. You're too valuable to me, to the camp, and especially to Frank. Hazel picked up an old valentine. The lacy white paper fell apart in her hands. I don't belong in this century. Nico only brought me back so I could correct my mistakes. Maybe get into Elysium. There's more to your destiny than that, he said. We're supposed to fight Gaia together. I'm going to need you at my side way longer than just today. And Frank, you can see the guy's crazy about you. This life is worth fighting for, Hazel. She closed her eyes. Please, don't get my hopes up. I can't... The window creaked open. Frank climbed in, triumphantly holding some shopping bags. Success! He showed off his prizes. From a hunting store, he'd got a few quiver of arrows for himself, some rations and a coil of rope. For the next time, we run across Muskeg, he said. From a local tourist shop, he had bought three sets of fresh clothes, some towels, some soap, some bottled water, and yes, a huge box of wet wipes. It wasn't exactly a hot shower, but Hazel ducked behind a wall of greeting card boxes to clean up and change. Soon, she was feeling much better. This is your last day, she reminded herself. Don't get too comfortable. The Feast of Fortuna, all the luck that happened today, good or bad, was supposed to be an omen of the entire year to come. One way or another, their quest would end this evening. She slipped the piece of driftwood into her new coat pocket. Somehow, she'd have to make sure it stayed safe, no matter what happened to her. She could bear her own death as long as her friends survived. So, she said, now we find a boat to Hubbard Glacier. She tried to sound confident, but it wasn't easy. She wished Arion was still here with her. She'd much rather ride into battle on that beautiful horse. Ever since they'd left Vancouver, she'd been calling to him in her thoughts, hoping he would hear her and come find her. But that was just wishful thinking. Frank patted his stomach. If we're going to battle to the death, I want lunch first. I found the perfect place. Frank led them to a shopping plaza near the wharf, where an old railway car had been converted to a diner. Hazel had no memory of the place from the 1940s, but the food smelled amazing. While Frank and Percy ordered, Hazel wandered down to the docks and asked some questions. When she came back, she needed cheering up. Even the cheeseburger and fries didn't do the trick. We're in trouble, she said. I tried to get a boat, but uh, I miscalculated. No boats, Frank asked. Oh, I can get a boat, Hazel said. But the glacier is further than I thought. Even at top speed, we couldn't get there until tomorrow, tomorrow morning. Percy turned pale. Maybe I could make the boat go faster. Even if you could, Hazel said. From what the captains tell me, it's treacherous. Icebergs, mazes of channels to navigate. You'd have to know where you were going. A plane? Frank asked. Hazel shook her head. I asked the boat captains about that. They said we could try, but it's a tiny airfield. You have to charter a plane, too. Two, three weeks in advance. They ate in silence after that. Hazel's cheeseburger was excellent, but she couldn't concentrate on it. She'd eaten about three bites when a raven settled on the telephone pole above and began to croak at them. Hazel shivered. She was afraid it would speak to her like the other raven so many years ago. The last night. Tonight. She wondered if ravens always appeared to children of Pluto when they were about to die. She hoped Nico was still alive and Gaia had just been lying to make her unsettled. Hazel had a bad feeling that the goddess was telling the truth. Nico had told her that he'd search for the doors of death from the other side. If he'd been captured by Gaia's forces, Hazel might have lost the only family she had. She stared at her cheeseburger. Suddenly, the raven's cawing changed to a strangled yelp. Frank got up so fast that he almost toppled the picnic table. Percy drew his sword. 
Hazel followed their eyes, perched on top of the pole where the raven had been. A fat, ugly griffin glared down at them. It burped and raven feathers fluttered from its beak. Hazel stood and unsheathed her spather. Frank knocked an arrow. He took aim, but the griffin shrieked so loudly the sound echoed off the mountains. Frank flinched and his shot went wide. I think that's a call for help, Percy warned. We have to get out of here. With no clear plan, they ran for the docks. The griffin dived after them. Percy slashed at it with his sword, but the griffin veered out of reach. They took the steps to the nearest pier and raced to the end. The griffin swooped after them, its front claws extended for the kill. Hazel raised her sword, but an icy wall of water slammed sideways into the griffin and washed it into the bay. The griffin squawked and flapped its wings. It managed to scramble onto the pier where it shook its black fur like a wet dog. Frank grunted. Nice one, Percy. Yeah, he said. Didn't know if I could still do that in Alaska, but bad news. Look over there. About a mile away, over the mountains, a black cloud was swirling. A whole flock of griffins, dozens at least. There was no way they could fight that many, and no boat could take them away fast enough. Frank knocked another arrow. Not going down without a fight. Percy raised Riptide. I'm with you. Then Hazel heard a sound in the distance, like the whinnying of a horse. She must have been imagining it, but she cried out desperately. Arian, over here. A tan blur came ripping down the street and onto the pier. The stallion materialised right behind the griffin, brought down his front hooves and smashed the monster to dust. Hazel had never been so happy in her life. Good horse, really good horse. Frank backed up and almost fell off the pier. How? He followed me, Hazel beamed, because he's the best horse ever. Now get on. All three of us, Percy said. Can he handle it? Arian whinnied indignantly. All right, no need to be rude, Percy said. Let's go. They climbed on, Hazel in front, Frank and Percy balancing precariously behind her. Frank wrapped his arms around her waist, and Hazel thought that if this was going to be her last day on Earth, it wasn't a bad way to go out. Run, Arian, she cried, to Hubbard Glacier. The horse shot across the water, his hooves turning the top of the sea to steam. Chapter 43. Hazel. Riding Arian, Hazel felt powerful, unstoppable, absolutely in control, a perfect combination of horse and human. She wondered if this was what it was like to be a centaur. The boat captains in Seward had warned her it was 300 nautical miles to the Hubbard Glacier, a hard, dangerous journey, but Arian had no trouble. He raced over the water at the speed of sound, heating the air around them so that Hazel didn't even feel the cold. On foot, she never would have felt so brave. On horseback, she couldn't wait to charge into battle. Frank and Percy didn't look so happy. When Hazel glanced back, their teeth were clenched and their eyeballs were bounce bouncing around in their heads. Frank's cheeks jiggled from the G-force. Percy sat at the back, hanging on tight, desperately trying not to slip off the horse's rear. Hazel hoped that didn't happen. The way Arian was moving, she might not notice he was gone for 50 or 60 miles. They raced through icy straits, past blue fjords and cliffs with waterfalls spilling into the sea. Arian jumped over a breaching humpback whale and kept galloping, startling a pack of seals off an iceberg. It seemed like only minutes before they zipped into a narrow bay. The water turned the consistency of shaved ice in blue sticky syrup. Arian came to a halt on a frozen turquoise slab. A half a mile away stood Hubbard Glacier. Even Hazel, who'd seen glaciers before, couldn't quite process what she was looking at. Purple snow-capped mountains marched off in either direction, with clouds floating around their middles like fluffy belts. In a massive valley between two of the largest peaks, a ragged wall of ice rose out of the sea, filling the entire gorge. The glacier was blue and white with streaks of black, so that it looked like a hedge of dirty snow left behind on a sidewalk after a snowplow had gone by, only four million times as large. As soon as Arian stopped, Hazel felt the temperature drop. All that ice was sending off waves of cold, turning the bay into the world's largest refrigerator. The eeriest thing was a sound like thunder that rolled across the water. What is that? Frank gazed at the clouds above the glacier. A storm? No, Hazel said. Ice cracking and shifting. Millions of tons of ice. You mean that thing is breaking up? Frank asked. As if on cue, a sheet of ice suddenly carved off the side of the glacier and crashed into the sea, spraying water and frozen shrapnel several stories high. A millisecond later, the sound hit them, a boom almost as jarring as Arian hitting the sound barrier. We can't get close to the thing, Frank said. We have to, Percy said. The giant is at the top. Arian nickered. Geez, Hazel, Percy said. Tell your horse to watch his language. Hazel tried not to laugh. What did he say? With the cussing removed? He said he can get us to the top. Frank looked incredulous. I thought the horse 
couldn't fly. This time, Arian whinnied so angrily, even Hazel could guess he was cursing. Dude, Percy told the horse, I've been suspended for saying less than that. Hazel, he promises you'll see what he can do as soon as you give the word. Um, hold on then, you guys, Hazel said nervously. Arian, giddy up. Arian shot towards the glacier like a runaway rocket, barreling straight across the slush like he wanted to play chicken with a mountain of ice. The air grew colder, the crackling of the ice grew louder. As Arian closed the distance, the glacier loomed so large that Hazel got vertigo just trying to t take it all in. The side was riddled with crevices and caves, spiked with jagged ridges like axe blades. Pieces were constantly crumbling off, some no larger than snowballs, some the size of houses. When they were about 50 yards from the base, a thunderclap rattled Hazel's bones and a curtain of ice that would have covered Camp Jupiter carved away and fell towards them. Look out, Frank shouted, which seemed a little unnecessary to Hazel. Arian was way ahead of him. In a burst of speed, he zigzagged through the debris, leaping over chunks of ice and clambering up the face of the glacier. Percy and Frank both cussed like horses and held on desperately while Hazel wrapped her arms around Arian's neck. Somehow they managed not to fall off as Arian scaled the cliffs, jumping from foothold to foothold with impossible speed and agility. It was like falling down a mountain in reverse. Then it was over. Arian stood proudly at the top of a ridge of ice that loomed over the void. The sea was now 300 feet below them. Arian whinnied a challenge that echoed off the mountains. Percy didn't translate, but Hazel was pretty sure Arian was calling out to any other horses that might be in the bay, Beat that, you punks! Then he turned and ran inland across the top of the glacier, leaping a chasm fifty feet across. There, Percy pointed, the horse stopped. Ahead of them stood a frozen Roman camp, like a giant-sized ghastly replica of Camp Jupiter. The trenches bristled with ice spikes, the snow-brick ramparts glared blinding white. Hanging from the guard towers, banners of frozen blue cloth shimmered in the Arctic sun. There was no sign of life. The gates stood wide open. No sentries walked the walls. Still, Hazel had an uneasy feeling in her gut. She remembered the cave in Resurrection Bay, where she'd worked to raise Alsonius. The oppressive sense of malice and the constant boom, 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 like Gaia's heartbeat. This place felt similar, as if the earth was trying to wake up and consume everything, as if the mountains on either side wanted to crush them and the entire glacier to pieces. Arian trotted skittishly. Frank, Percy said, how about we go on foot from here? Frank sighed with relief. Thought you'd never ask. They dismounted and took some tentative steps. The ice seemed stable, covered with a fine carpet of snow, so that it wasn't too slippery. Hazel urged Arian forward. Percy and Frank walked on either side, sword and bow ready. They approached the gates without being challenged. Hazel was trained to spot pits, snares, trip lines, and all sorts of other traps Roman legions had faced for eons in enemy territory. But she saw nothing, just the yawning ice gates and the frozen banners crackling in the wind. She could see straight down the Via Pretoria, at the crossroads, in front of the snow-brick Principia. A tall, dark-robed figure stood, bound in icy chains. Fanatos, Hazel murmured. She felt as if her soul was being pulled forward, drawn towards death like dust towards a vacuum. Her vision went dark. She almost fell off Arian, but Frank caught her and propped her up. We've got you, he promised. Nobody's taking you away. Hazel gripped his hand. She didn't want to let go. He was so solid, so reassuring, but Frank couldn't protect her from death. His own life was as fragile as a half-burnt piece of wood. I'm all right, she lied. Percy looked around uneasily. No defenders? No giant? This has to be a trap. Obviously, Frank said, but I don't think we have a choice. Before Hazel could change her mind, she urged Arian through the gates. The layout was so familiar. Cohort barracks, baths, armory. It was an exact replica of Camp Jupiter, except three times as big. Even on horseback, Hazel felt tiny and insignificant, as if they were moving through a model city constructed by the gods. They stopped ten feet from the robed figure. Now that she was here, Hazel felt a reckless urge to finish the quest. She knew she was in more danger than when she'd been fighting the Amazons, or fending off the Griffins, or climbing the glacier on Arian's back. Instinctively, she knew that Fanatos could simply touch her, and she would die. But she also had a feeling that if she didn't see the quest through, if she didn't face her fate bravely, she would still die, in cowardice and failure. The judges of the dead wouldn't be lenient to her a second time. Arian cantered back and forth, sensing her disquiet. Hello? Hazel forced out the word. Mr. Death? The hooded figure raised his head. Instantly the whole camp stirred to life. Figures in Roman armour emerged from the barracks, the Principia, the armoury and the canteen, but they weren't human. They were shades. 
The chattering ghosts Hazel had lived with for decades in the fields of Asphodel. Their bodies weren't much more than wisps of black vapour, but they managed to hold together sets of scale armour, greaves and helmets. Frost-covered swords were strapped to their waists. Pillar and dented shields floated in their smoky hands. The plumes on the centurion's helmets were frozen and ragged. Most of the shades were on foot, but two soldiers burst out of the stables in a golden chariot pulled by ghostly black steeds. When Arian saw the horses, he stamped the ground in outrage. Frank gripped his bow. Yep, here's the trap. Chapter 44, Hazel. The ghosts formed ranks and encircled the crossroads. There were about a hundred in all, not an entire legion, but more than a cohort. Some carried the tattered lightning bolt banners of the 12th Legion, 5th cohort, Michael Varus's doomed expedition from the 1980s. Others carried standards and insignia Hazel didn't recognise, as if they died at different times on different quests, maybe not even from Camp Jupiter. Most were armed with Imperial Gold weapons, more Imperial Gold than the entire 12th Legion possessed. Hazel could feel the combined power of all that gold humming around her, even scarier than the crackling of the glacier. She wondered if she could use her power to control the weapons, maybe disarm the ghosts, but she was afraid to try. Imperial gold wasn't just a precious metal, it was deadly to demigods and monsters. Trying to control that much at once would be like trying to control plutonium in a reactor. If she failed, she would, might wipe out Hubbard Glacier off the map and kill her friends. Fanatos, Hazel turned to the robed figure. We're here to rescue you. If you control these shades, tell them. Her voice faltered. The god's hood fell away and his robes dropped off as he spread his wings, leaving him in only a sleeveless black tunic belted at the waist. He was the most beautiful man Hazel had ever seen. His skin was the colour of teakwood, dark and glistening like Queen Marie's old seance table. His eyes were as honey gold as Hazel's. He was lean and muscular, with a regal face and black hair flowing down his shoulders. His wings glimmered in shades of blue, black and purple. Hazel reminded herself to breathe. Beautiful was the right word for Fanatos. Not handsome or hot or anything like that. He was beautiful the way an angel is beautiful. Timeless, perfect, remote. Oh, she said in a small voice. The god's wrists were shackled in icy manacles with chains that ran straight into the glacier floor. His feet were bare, shackled around the ankles and also chained. It's Cupid, Frank said. A really buff Cupid, Percy agreed. You compliment me, Fanatos said. His voice was as gorgeous as he was, deep and melodious. I am frequently mistaken for the god of love. Death has more in common with love than you might imagine. But I am death, I assure you. Hazel didn't doubt it. She felt as if she were made of ashes. Any second she might crumble and be sucked into the vacuum. She doubted Fanatos even needed to touch her to kill her. He could simply tell her to die. She would keel over on the spot, her soul obeying that beautiful voice and those kind eyes. We're, we're, we're here to save you, she managed. Where's Alsonius? Save me. Fanatos narrowed his eyes. Do you understand what you are saying, Hazel Levesque? Do you understand what that will mean? Percy stepped forward. We're wasting time. He swung his sword at the god's chains. Celestial bronze rang against the ice, but Riptide stuck to the chain like glue. Frost began creeping up the blade. Percy pulled for frantically. Frank ran to help. Together they just managed to yank Riptide free before the frost reached their hands. That won't work, Fanatos said simply. As for the giant, he is close. These shades are not mine. They are his. Fanatos's eyes scanned the ghost soldiers. They shifted uncomfortably, as if an arctic wind were rattling through their ranks. So, how do we get you out? Hazel demanded. Fanatos turned his attention back to her. Daughter of Pluto, child of my master, you of all people should not wish me released. Don't you know? Don't you think I know that? Hazel's eyes stung, but she was done being afraid. She'd been a scared little girl 70 years ago. She'd lost her mother because she acted too late. Now she was a soldier of Rome. She wasn't going to fail again. She wasn't going to let down her friends. Listen, death. She drew her cavalry sword, and Arian reared in defiance. I didn't come back from the underworld and travel thousands of miles to be told that I'm stupid for setting you free. If I die, I die. I'll fight this whole army if I have to. Just tell us how to break your chains. Fanatos studied her for a heartbeat. Interesting. You do understand that these shades were once demigods like you. They fought for Rome. They died without completing their heroic quests. Like you, they were sent to Asphodel. 
Now Gaia has promised them a second life if they fight for, for her today. Of course, if you release me and defeat them, they will have to return to the underworld where they belong. For treason against the gods, they will face eternal punishment. They are not so different from you, Hazel Levesque. Are you sure you want to release me and damn these souls forever? Frank clenched his fists. That's not fair. Do you want to be freed or not? Fair, Death mused. You'd be amazed how often I hear that word, Frank Zhang, and how meaningless it is. It is fair that your life will burn so short and bright? Was it fair when I guided your mother to the underworld? Frank staggered, like he'd been punched. No, Death said sadly, not fair, and yet it was her time. There is no fairness in Death. If you free me, I will do my duty, but of course these shades will try to stop you. So, if we let you go, Percy summed up. We get mobbed by a bunch of black vapour dudes with gold swords. Fine. How do we break those chains? Fenatos smiled. Only the fire of life can melt the chains of death. Without the riddles, please? Percy asked. Frank drew a shaky breath. It isn't a riddle. Frank, no, Hazel said weakly. There's got to be another way. Laughter boomed across the glacier. A rumbling voice said, My friends, I've waited so long. Standing at the gates of the camp was Alsonius. He was even larger than the giant polypotus they'd seen in California. He had metallic golden skin, armour made from platinum links, and an iron staff the size of a totem pole. His rust-red dragon legs pounded against the ice as he entered the camp. Precious stones glinted in his red braided hair. Hazel had never seen him fully formed, but she knew him better than she knew her own parents. She had made him. For months, she had raised golden gems from the earth to create this monster. She knew the diamonds he used for a heart. She knew the oil that ran in his veins instead of blood. More than anything, she wanted to destroy him. The giant approached, grinning at her with his solid silver teeth. Ah, Hazel Levesque, he said. You cost me dearly. If not for you, I would have risen decades ago, and this world would already be Gaia's. But no matter. He spread his hands, showing off the ranks of ghostly soldiers. Welcome, Percy Jackson. Welcome, Frank Zhang. I am Alsonius, the bane of Pluto, the new master of death, and this is your new legion.